Welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show on 94.7 The Pulse. Music, interviews, news and, well, two blokes chatting. Now, here are the two blokes. Yes, it's um, it's a bit exciting because when we were younger people... Um, and when she was as well. We re- relied on our televisions to keep us entertained because back in those days the stuff on the television was entertaining. And one of those things was called Sale of the Century and Tony Barber had some assistance along the way and one of those was a pretty young Elise Platt and now here we are all these years later. She's still in the industry and hasn't really stopped in the industry because she has got multiple talents and we're very happy to have her on the show this morning. Good morning Elise. Good morning. Lovely to be on your show. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll ask you the same question in 20 minutes or so and see whether it has been or not. <laughs> um, your name popped up in my email during the week and I thought, wow, there's a person we haven't heard from for a little while and a really, really interesting program that you've been working on over the, not program as, in, you know, as a piece of work that you've been working on over the last little while, which we'll come back to, which includes that song. But uh, we, I guess we should wind the clock back to when we first saw you on our screens in Suds and Dishma, uh, Sons and Daughters, wasn't it? Correct, yeah, that was last century. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Literally. that's making us feel old. <laughs> Literally. I know, it's, it's like when you were just introducing me then and reflecting back on at the time, it's like, wow, we're old. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are, but we've grown old Elise together. That's the important thing. And this is the difference of the Australian television. I, I, I remember in the old, olden days, we were very welded to our television. We were welded to the people on it. Um, you were sorts of heroes and, and f- filled an important part in uh, developing us. Television was very much part of our lives. Well, Not so much the these days. The, one of the things that really you know made us stay there is because we didn't really have remotes, did we? No, that's right. It's an effort to flick you off. (laughs) Get up. I can't stand this. Someone going to... Nah, it's all right. (laughs) You know what I mean? I mean, it's it's a disposable kind of world anyway, but not so much back then. And I think that's perhaps one of the reasons is we, you know, we just had to... Yeah, you had to endure us because it was a huge effort to get your dinner off your lap because I think a lot of families did gather around and answer the questions or oh, no. do that. The evening meal had to be eaten at the table. No, my family, we had to eat at the table. Yeah. No watching. And Very much happened. so. <laughs> Elise, let's go all the way back. We know about Sale of the Century, but there was a lot going in on your life before then. Where did where did you start out? Where did you born, raised up? What sort of a childhood well, have you get you into entertainment? I'm a very proud Melbourne person. I was born in Melbourne. I grew up in the Dandenongs, a place called Fern Tree Gully. And I I just was one of those people that always, you know, fortunately I knew that I wanted to, to, well, I started out playing guitar and singing at eight. And that was pretty much me, you know. I would be, you know, wheeled out at the parties and boring all the adults with my guitar playing and singing. And, you know, I used to write all these little sort of sad songs in my bedroom. And then I thought, oh, no, I want to do acting as well. So I sort of had that just driving me and I drove it all the way my parents didn't I mean I did go to ballet and jazz classes and then I had guitar lessons and singing you know I was very very lucky in that but I got into a drama music course at what was called Box Hill TAFE back then a tertiary orientation program so it was a softer version of year 12 and I went into a recording studio and did songs and the engineer said oh you'd be really good at doing um, session singing and I said oh what's that I didn't know what it was he said look I'll introduce you to someone I think his name was Paul Davies uh, advertising agency Clemenger Harvey and I didn't tell my parents that I got this number and I rang up and made the appointment and I didn't realize how high up this person was and off I went on the train without my mum and dad knowing I think I was 16 and um, gave them a cassette of my songs and he was intrigued and knew that I was quite young and said, oh, what else are you doing? And I said, I'm going to be an actress and I'm studying acting. And then a producer came in and they were casting a, a commercial for um, East Coast Jeans, which was based on the Book Shields Jeans commercial for Calvin Klein in America at the time. And by the time I got back, 
to Burntree Gully on the train, they'd phoned my mum and dad and said, <laughs> it was like your daughter, to come in for an audition. <laughs> and I got into really big trouble. They go, what are you talking about? Where is she? Where's my daughter? Anyway, luckily, I got I got the gig. And that was the beginning. Um, I you know, became the East Coast Jeans girl. And then from that, I got a, an acting agent. And then from there, I went on to Sons and Daughters. So that's sort of how it happened, was one of those. Yeah, so it, it, there's a lot of people who who you know go down that same path, and you know it, it, there's an element of talent, there's an element of being right place, right time. I suspect meeting some handy people were, was an important part of that process. Well, I suppose being doing a, a drama music course and being you know exposed to recording studios, then I guess that's the right people, right time. You know, yeah, it does. It works like that. And, and But I really believe, because there's so many talented people who I've come across who are just so gifted, but they don't have the extra bit, which is the determination and mm. got to drive. And I think, I think that's what it is. You, the child, the person, the adult, have to drive it. I don't think it's about mum or dad going, there, come on, we want you to be this. I think they, you have to want to be that. That's what I, I believe anyway. Uh, after the initial um, upsetting of the parents, how did, did they quickly fall in line and become very supportive? Because at 16, well, you need yeah. to be driven to a lot of places. That's right. Oh, and they did. They drove me everywhere. Well, I, absolutely, because I got the gig and I got paid really well. And then I was on, you know, billboards and posters and that very, very proud. Oh, no, it was a very supportive um, thing in the end. I think they were just would like to have known that I, I mean, well, I wouldn't have been allowed to go in on the train on my own back then. They would have driven me, but I just, I don't know, I did it. <laughs> uh, Elise, there's been a lot of stories about the difficulty that some uh, attractive young women had in the entertainment industry, uh, the way you were treated. Did did you find um, issues along the way or, or did you... Absolutely. Uh, look, it was the culture. It was the 80s, early 90s, but predominantly, I mean, I guess... No, it, I was like mid-80s when I entered into that world and it was extremely male-dominating, chauvinistic kind of... I mean, I feel awful saying that because there was really lovely people as well, but it was just how it was. And, um, yeah, there was a lot of that. I mean, nothing really horrendous happened to me, thanks, thankfully. Nothing really at all, but it was just the... the, the the way it was, you know, women were patted on the bum and had to. I mean, I had a, I had a, a situation where I think, gosh, I was twenty one or twenty two, and I got called up because I I think it was when Alan Bond bought Channel Nine from Packer, and they were doing a big barbecue on the Yarra to celebrate this, and I'd not long been to Perth. I'd been singing on a telephone, and and I'd found this incredible jacket in an op shop that was Royal Western Australian Bowlers Association, Swanbourne. And I thought, oh, I'll wear that to the barbecue. And, of course, people from Perth went, what's that? And I said, oh, isn't it fabulous? It's a jacket I've got over in Perth. And I guess op shop wasn't so groovy back then. And I said, no, I got it for a dollar. It's great. And then I got into trouble for that. I got called up complaining that stars don't wear op shop clothes. Stars must always wear makeup when they go out. Because, I mean, I didn't really wear a lot of makeup. It was a role that I was playing on Sales of Century that wasn't really me. Like, I wouldn't step out into, you know, my hair done and high heels to go shopping. I was a kid. Mm. And and I had to lose weight. And I was a size 10. <laughs> yeah, glad you can't see us. <laughs> but no, but you know what I mean? It was very much that. Yeah. And I was so offended. And then at, at the Christmas party in Sydney, someone from Channel 9 up there was complimenting me and saying how refreshing it was and what a natural person on television, how much they enjoyed watching me. And I just went, well, can you believe that they were going to sack me because I was this, this and this? And they went, no. And then all of a sudden he calls over... Um, What's his name? Chisholm, who's now part. Sam. Sam, thank you. Very scary man. <laughs> For me, anyway. And I am I just told him what I thought, and I was poking him in the chair and saying, how dare you do that? And who do you think you are? And I mean, honestly, 
we do? I think I was <laughs> doing that. And then the next morning, I had all my mates staying in my hotel room. I think there was Peter Phelps, Ali Fowler, Kim Lewis. We're all, you know, like, hey, bar, the, the mini bar's open. Let's all just crash in Elise's suite and have fun. And I think we were just innocently there, just crashed out. And one of them answered the phone and went, who are you? And someone said, oh, at least it's someone called Sam on the phone. And the phone got passed across to me and I went, oh, no, this is it. Yeah. Interesting you touched on the the size 10 and losing weight uh, in a week where the Australian of the Year um, announced yes, about exactly. the important thing about body image. Um, exactly. You said uh, thinking back to those days and the, and the modern world we live in, do you, did you celebrate that appointment? Um. Oh, completely, 100%. Yes, it's so, it's so necessary. I mean, we're so distorted in, in our body images. However, I know a lot of younger kids, like younger people, and, and they are really healthy in their, in their bodies. So I think, I think it's, there is a switch as well. It's a bit of both going on, but, but there, there are some really healthy parents, you know, who are supporting body image so um I, I mean i do but but i i also know that there's a lot of comfortable kids out there who are just like you know happy to to do that and i wasn't you know i was skinny really but i was incredibly self-conscious mm. then. um so yeah and I, I guess the role that you were playing on on sale of the century uh was not you weren't there to have intellectual conversations with no. Tony, where you were there to, to look good and present the prizes and that kind of stuff. Thankfully, we have come a long way and we look at some of the women who are on TV now in important roles and we see the Tracy Grimshaws and the Lisa Wilkinsons of the world who yeah. probably wouldn't get a look in, but, well, they would have because they were at that age group, but you know that sort of person just wouldn't have got a crack in a serious role on television. No, that's right. Absolutely not. No, we, well... Yeah, and all the anchor men, it was men, mm. you know, or, and then the side person was, was female. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, musical theatre, Elise, um, it's many that do it regarded as the the best fix in entertainment. It's that instant um, audience response and you get a chance to, to really ply your trade. How, how much did you enjoy that part of your life? Not very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> no, look... It's really interesting. I, I don't know. I just... I, I struggled with, with musical theatre in particular. It just was a world that was really... I had, uh, you know, once again, I had pretty bad experiences in, in that world and I felt bullied and, and I think I came into it when I was incredibly famous on television. So... The two weren't meant to be together. So, because I was a television star and I, you know, was appearing, you know, on these shows on musical theatre, Seven Little Australian being one, it it was a struggle for me. And I I could have easily gone down that path. I had it, like I had the voice to do that. I I'd, I'd been training and and I could, but but I it just. It wasn't my passion. It's and and I to be honest, I don't really go to musical theatre. It's not something that I love. I'll go to theatre to plays, but not musical theatre. And I don't know whether that's because of my experience as a younger person that it's done that to me. But I don't think so. It's just not not something I really go to. <laughs> And I think, it, it, you know, clearly Rob and I are neither, uh, neither of us have any great experience in musical theatre, although Rob does a little bit of amateur stuff. But I would have, just sitting, looking at it, it looks like incredibly hard work. Um, and if you're not loving it... Yeah, it, it is. It's incredibly hard work and requires, well, it, it takes over your life. If you join up for a run, you know, that is it. That That is your life. There is very little time to do anything else. And... Yeah, and ex exactly. If it's not a joyous experience when you're there, why do it? You lost me when you said you're going for a run. That <laughs> Straight off the bat, you've lost me. So let's fast forward to uh, 2020. And uh, we had a thing in Geelong, I don't know whether you had it, it called COVID-19 popped up in our world down here. Uh, you took a novel approach to um, keeping yourself sane and involved the bathroom. Now, we need to point out at this point, Elise, the expression bathroom 
uh, on our program, we are talking about a room that has a bath in it, aren't we? We're not talking about one that has a toilet in it. No, no, we're, t- we're talking about a bath. Excellent. Yes. It is a very important distinction for our listeners these days. Very much so. Oh, okay, right. Yes, no, it has a shower, or well, in this case, a shower, a bathroom, and a bath, yes. And a window that's behind your head in the film clips. And a window, <laughs> right, yes. So, so tell us, A, what you did, and, and B, what, where the idea came from. So what I did is when we got the world stopped and everybody was under house arrest, it was confronting for everybody. I actually liked it, to be honest. It, it suited my introvert nature. Me too. <laughs> I'm really happy to kind of fit in my little cave. And I thought, oh, I don't really want to make bread. I know a lot of people were making bread. Um, what am I going to do? And I said, I know what. I'm going to just go through the world of songs and I'm going to challenge myself with learning a song on the guitar a day and songs that I'd never heard or songs that I'd vaguely, vaguely heard of or I've never performed. I've heard them, but I've never sung them. And so I began to, to do this. And then I was... You know, living with other people, I thought, oh, I'll just go into the bathroom because it sounds good in there. And so, you know, I went into the bathroom and there I stayed. And then I got all creative with the... So I actually recorded them on the video on my mobile phone. And I had this really... <laughs> I never had a tripod. You know how now you've got... Like, I didn't have a, tr- uh, a selfie stick or, yep. or a glow stick or anything to enhance the way I looked or position it. So I, it was very guerrilla um, filmmaking. So I had, I think, the cord of my dressing gown and some string and I had a towel rack <laughs> <laughs> and I fashioned the phone and so I could experiment with the different angles. So you'll see me, if anyone goes to YouTube to look at at least flat, you know, bathtub studio sessions. I'm there in different positions. I'm inside the bath. I'm the, I'm on, on the tiles next to the bath, or I'm standing, and that's me putting the phone in all these different positions. And so then I thought, oh, so I'd do a couple of takes. I went, oh no, that one's good. And then I thought, oh, I'll just share it on social media. And there began um, an engagement with an audience in need of connection, as was I. And I thought, oh. Everyone was waiting for another instalment, and that's how it began. So I stayed in there for, you know, a long time (laughs) doing that. (laughs) It takes a whole new meaning on She's been in the bathroom a long time, doesn't it? But I'm still in there. (laughs) And then, then, um, you know, that ended. We came out and did all sorts of other things, and I was listening back. Oh, no, that's right. I started an album, an original album with an American producer who was over here during, in between our moments of, you know, long periods of lockdown. And we recorded 10 of my songs remotely on his remote studio. And that was the next album I was working on because the previous one was Funny Little World. And then he went back to San Francisco and I just got curious about those songs. And I thought, oh, gosh, they sound really good. I wonder what it would be like as an audio file, as an album. So I sent them to a friend who's an engineer and I said, can you just cut this up a little bit for me and we'll see what it's like and he said it sounds great and I went "Mm, maybe I could get other instruments that could come onto it and I at the time that I was playing around with that idea there was grants happening so I applied for a grant and I got one to make it into an album and then I would send the files to various people and they recorded their parts in their home studio but but the part of the thing about the record is I was capturing a moment in time. So my engineer said, oh, I think the guitar's a bit fast there and you're a little bit out of tune and that. And I went, no, no, no. And he said, I can hear the dog barking. <laughs> and that's in um, uh, Everybody's Talking, the single that was released last week. You can hear a panting in the background. Well, that's Patsy, my mum's dog. And Patsy was in the bathroom with me a lot. And I went, no, no, that's the idea. I want, I want all of that. That's the character of the album. And then when we mixed the instruments, it was like I wanted them to be positioned in the mix as though they represented nostalgia and the outside world. Because all the songs are pretty much from the 70s, I think, 70s, mm. late 60s, I think, oh, except for The uh, the Cure and Paul Kelly. 
So that that was it. And then I, I finished it, mixed it, and decided to call it bain douche, which is French for bath shower. So yep. there is is the story <laughs> at least well, in the bathroom <laughs> we we heard nights in white satin as as rob was uh, talking to you on the phone and we're going to hear everybody's talking because that's the the single that's just come out but i think i had a look at the, the the video clips as well i think it's fair to say um the word unsophisticated comes to mind um you haven't spent a lot of money on costumes i think one of them you may have your pjs on i do i have my pajamas and no makeup <laughs> yeah and so and, and that's the thing isn't it? i mean any anyone can sound good and can look good with enough makeup and enough computer involvement on this. But this is raw in every sense of the word, even down to there's no not even any flowers in your bathroom. It's just your bathroom. That's right. It's grouse. That's the only word I can use to describe it. It's grouse. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, we're having a chat to this young lady. <laughs> it was funny because I'd get people who knew me and they go, are you all right? I said, like, well, you just don't look. I'm going, oh, I'm, I'm fine. That's because, you know, I'm, I'm not wearing makeup and, you know, and I'm, I, 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 to be honest, I don't like brushing my hair. <laughs> well, Rob would love to brush his if he had any. Yeah. I don't like brushing my hair. I'd have, you know, perhaps I've got a big, you know, bird's nest on the back. So it's very much raw, authentic, you know, in the moment, in the time. And that's, that's the sound that, oh, sorry, I've got to give zillion dogs around here. That's all part of the fun. Um, that's the sound that I wanted to capture, and, and, and it works. I think, I think people relate to the sound of the rec- I was actually, and this doesn't happen very often when you're at a, a gathering, like I was at a lunch in Paddington, and I'd done a house concert up in Sydney, and then the next day someone said, oh, I'd love you to come over, you know, we'll have a lunch. And, I, you know, I never expected that they were going to play my album. <laughs> During lunch, it was really embarrassing. <laughs> but I have to say, it worked. I thought, oh, no, this, is, this goes nicely with lunch. You know, it's, it, was, it sort of came, it came across really well, and they, they loved it. And, and I wondered whether that's what was carrying it, is that all of those parts. It's you know, sort of got that uh, beer garden music... Um, feel to it that you could just have it in, in yes in the background and listening it's very nice yeah, well it's, it's intimate and and it's it's not affected you know it's very very real and, and raw and that's where i saw the link with this program i mean <laughs> this program is is very much the same i mean rob and i walk in here at nine o'clock on a saturday morning and start chatting for two hours and as soon as i heard the music i thought i think we've just found our soul sister in in singing yeah, because definitely. it just fits straight in uh now Lise, um one more um hard hitting one uh, you you intrigued me using the word uh, introvert. Um, I want you to take your mind back to that 16-year-old girl who snuck away from mum and dad yep. to pursue her career in the entertainment industry where 43 years later, di- yep. did you find what you were looking for when you were that brave little 16-year-old considering that you I'm called yourself an introvert? I'm still looking for it. I really think I'll be looking for it until the day I die. Because this is the thing. You see, I think introvert people think you're shy. And you are. And I do have that about me. You can still be outgoing as an introvert. But um, we were just talking about it last night over dinner. That an introvert is a person who, well, I, my understanding of it is, um, needs to go to their cave, needs to retreat mm. to their own space to recharge their batteries and to find meaning in the world. Whereas an extrovert needs other people and other people, find they find meaning in the world through them, but they deplete me, people deplete me. <laughs> yeah, and, and you've obviously got un, unfaltering faith in, the, in your talent and skill without bragging about it, and that's probably been an important part for an introvert. Yeah, look... I don't know. I think it's just that it's something I've always done and I know and I do. I have a love-hate relationship with it because it can be so painful as well at the same time. And I battle with it all the time. It's just this, it's never easy and I'm a perfectionist, you know, even though I'm, I, I just, yeah, I struggle with, oh, I'm shocking, I'm not good, I'm not talented, I'm terrible, I shouldn't be doing this. And there, there I am again doing it. <laughs> Quite bizarre. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to take your your explanation of being an introvert, and I'm going to cut that, and I'm going to carry that on my phone because I'm sick to death of trying to explain to people I'm an introvert, and yet I sit here on a Saturday morning and and talk to people, and, and they, they, they just simply don't get it, do they? 
They don't. No. no. They say, no, you're not. Going, no, 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 I am. Uh, believe me. <laughs> really, I was saying I, I lived with some very dear friends who were in Hollywood for a moment beginning his extraordinary career. This is Hugh Jackman and Deborah Lee. I'm scouting now, but I'm very, very, very close friends with them and they're um, godmother to their children. And it was when Hugh had just started um, Wolverine and I was in the house with them and my room was the sunroom that was had glass doors and I thought, oh my God, this is going to be a nightmare. How am I going to escape? And I had a wardrobe that you could sit in and I used to go and see the wardrobe. <laughs> Well, because they're not introverts, they're extroverts. I got that I, sense, yes. And, and I just, you know, beautiful, gorgeous people and that, but I, that's just, yeah, that's what I had to do to find, you know, to find myself. I had to get and sit in the dark in the wardrobe. Well, if ever either of them need a bit of a, a profile lift in, in Australia, just let them know. We'd be more than happy to chat to them on the Two Blokes Chatting Radio <laughs> show as well. <laughs> <laughs> Before we let you go, we should tell you one thing though. Our, every second week we have a female, not a female sports reporter, a reporter on female sports. She is a female, but her name is Elise and her name is spelt A-L-Y-C-E. She was born in the late 1980s. I reckon you can do the maths. Yeah, and do you know what? She's not alone. I can't tell you how many people come up to me or I get phone calls and I got one last week, seriously from a friend who's in Brunswick Head, he went to the shop and the girl had ALYC on her badge and then the man before him went, thank you, Alice, which is what happens to me all the time. Mm. But my name is not Alice, it's Elise. And then she said, I was named after Elise Platt. <laughs> and that happened. I think at the time it was one of those names and the spelling of it that really, you know, people liked. So there's a gazillion of those stories and my mum would be very proud my late mum yeah, well, Elise will be listening so uh, hello to, our, to the other Elise I love my name I hope she does <laughs> Elise <laughs> thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to chat to us I know that you're yeah, travelling today to do a gig again. but uh, it's yeah, been great right. I'm doing a gig tonight in, in I have to say Castlemaine that's I'm better you do with Joe Mears from Sydney that's tonight at the tap room so if, I don't know how far Geelong um, Oh, a couple of hours. Yeah, and cut across country. three quarters. I think yeah. you get the but castle get, mine. We, we get people listening everywhere. Yeah, so if anyone's in the area, um, yeah, drop in. It'll be a fun night. You give us a buzz when you come to Geelong, by the way, and uh, we'll get yeah. you back on to promote that little gig. But would uh, love to do that. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. More for us. Right, like talking with you both. <laughs> All the best. Thanks, Elise. Good, good luck with your wonderful thing. Thank you. See ya.